Hi everyone, it's me, Janelle Rhiannon, and I am back once again talking about characters from Greek mythology. Today, I wanna to talk about Clytemnestra. She's probably my favorite female character of all the characters that I've read and researched about, and she's probably the most well-known for the end of her story. Everybody is usually familiar with uh, Clytemnestra because she cuts Agamemnon's throat when he returns back from Troy. She and her lover do that. So, you know, that sort of is the thing that we think about. And also that her daughter and Agamemnon's daughter was killed by Agamemnon. Uh, that was Iphigenia. So we're familiar with those two aspects of her story, but she's so much more than that. And when we look at the pieces of her life that we have throughout mythology, we have a wider picture of why she perhaps was moved to do what she did. You know, why didn't she just run off? Why didn't she just leave Mycenae because uh, Agamemnon wasn't there? He was gone for almost 10 years. Why didn't she just take off and go do something else? She's driven. She is a very driven, strong, resilient, and somewhat cold figure, I think. So let's let's kind of look at what we know about Clytemnestra. Well, first of all, she starts out her life in Sparta. She is the daughter of King Tyndareus and Queen Leda. These are the same parents of Helen and Castor and Pollux. So again, there are different variations whether uh, Leda was raped by Zeus and she had four eggs, two of them uh, belonging to Zeus and two uh, to Dendarius. I go into my podcast about how I, I break that up because it makes most sense when you're trying to put things chronological. The main point is that she is a daughter of Tyndarius and Queen Leda and she does happen to be Helen's sister. So she starts out her life in Sparta, very similar to uh, what Helen's life and experience were. She is then married off for the first time. Now that's something most people don't know about Clytemnestra is that she has two marriages. Agamemnon was her second husband. Her first husband was a prince of Mycenae by the name of Tantalus. Now mythologically, there are three different Tantaluses and in the fragments we have, I call them Tantalus II and Tantalus III, and they are associated with Clytemnestra, and for the sake of for my writing, I merge them into one character. But she, does, she is married to King Theseus' son, and she bears him a child. Now, Agamemnon comes to Mycenae and basically militarily takes over and he ruthlessly kills Clytemnestra's first child by her first husband. So that is Clytemnestra's real beginning experience with Agamemnon. So you're already thinking, wait a minute, doesn't he kill Iphigenia later? Yeah, he does. So technically, really, Agamemnon has killed two of Clytemnestra's children. That would be enough to make any mother want to cut this guy's throat, right? So that's her experience. Now, Agamemnon takes over Mycenae through some sort of machination, political back dealings with Tyndareus. And it's and we we can suppose that because after her husband is killed and her child is killed. Tyndarius gives his blessing and marries his daughter off to uh, Agamemnon and then assumes the role. She was a princess in Mycenae and now she is elevated to queen because Agamemnon is now king. So she marries Agamemnon and becomes queen of Mycenae. So that's that part of her story. She is going to go on and have children with Agamemnon because she doesn't have any way not to. She is a prize, so to speak, of Agamemnon's war with to t take control of Mycenae with her father's blessing. So 
two things. Not only is she going to have a developed anger, hatred, revenge, feelings, right, uh, against and for Agamemnon, but also I would imagine for her father. Even in the Bronze Age, I think for a woman to have to endure her husband being killed and her child being killed for political gain at her father's approval is a bit much, even for the Bronze Age. So I, I you know, kind of keep those things in mind when you are thinking about and you know who Clytemnestra was and and what's driving her this this her whole life this whole time and I mean by this whole time that ten year gap when Agamemnon has gone off and, and in Troy and he's not around so that's that's the that's first so after that we can sort of fast forward a little bit she does have Iphigenia she has Orestes and she has Electra. And the timeline that I developed to sort of, how do these myths all make sense together, places those kids as having been born by the time that Iphigenia is sent off to Aulis uh, to, under the pretense of marrying Achilles. So that's something that um, most people are unaware of. There was a, Convert. That's how that that's how Agamemnon gets Clytemnestra to bring Iphigenia to Aulis is under that pretext of marrying Achilles. Only when she gets there, Clytemnestra goes with right. So they get there, and it's not until the eleventh hour that Clytemnestra or Iphigenia realize that she's not going to marry Achilles, but is indeed going to be sacrificed for some other purpose, for the winds to blow so that the amassed army can sail to Troy. Um, Clytemnestra is present when her daughter is sacrificed by her husband, and of course, then the winds blow and Artemis releases Agamemnon from the curse that she puts on him, i.e. no wind blowing. So, you know, now we have that. So now we, th that's sort of in a nutshell, those two things really sink in for Clytemnestra. And perhaps over the years, she was able to, I don't want to say forgive because that's, that's kind of too strong a word, but maybe she was able to sort of forget or suppress, that's a better word, suppress the, the facts of how she came to, to become Queen of Mycenae and Agamemnon's wife. Um, but now when Agamemnon has murdered her second child, I don't know if you can ever, you know, everything in the past is going to come flooding forward. I don't know how she's going to get past that. I don't, I don't think that a woman could. I don't think anybody could do that, right? Like, uh, turn the other cheek and then turn the other cheek. You don't have any more cheeks left. You know, I guess your butt cheeks, but I don't think that's the point, right? Um, so, she is, and so that's kind of where we know her story. But she is left then as the, the United Greek tribes sail off to Troy. She's left to deal with the body of and the burial of her, of Iphigenia. She takes Iphigenia back to Mycenae and has a proper burial, which includes a burning by Pyre and all the, the, the rites um, that Iphigenia would have as a, a princess of Mycenae. So now we have the beginning of that 10 years of, or almost 10 years of waiting around and wondering when Agamemnon is going to come back from Troy, if he's gonna be victorious. So what is she doing in that almost decade long wait? Can you imagine just having 10 years to sort of think up what you wanna to do to somebody who has murdered two of your children? That's Clytemnestra, right? So she ends up taking a lover. Her lover is uh, called Agathus. 
I get this is actually a younger half-brother of Agamemnon. That's interesting, right? So with Agathis, she does have a few other children, but let's just kind of jump back to the beginning. So she meets Agathis and with him, and he has his own reasons for wanting to kill Agamemnon. And they go back to avenging his father. And there's a little bit of a complicated story there. I wanna focus on Clytemnestra for right now. So I guess I'll just do a podcast or something about that or a separate episode. But let's just stay focused on Clytemnestra. So she ends up with Agathis and over a period of time, they have some children and they are developing a plot to kill Agamemnon when he returns from Troy. So you can sort of see how that makes a lot of sense, that it, it, it actually, it seems really logical. And when you really think about her position, why would you not want to, right? Agamemnon deserved it. At least, you know, I guess I think so <laughs> from that mother's perspective. Now, taking a couple steps back, she had the two, before she, before Agamemnon leaves for Troy, they have the two children following Iphigenia, which are Orestes and Electra. So what is happening during that period of time when, um, she had when she is pl plotting basically what to do with her position in Mycenae. Obviously, she stays in Mycenae, she doesn't go anywhere. So, she is amassing some kind of political sway. She's able to be running and in charge of what's going on in Mycenae. She is the queen, right, of the city. Relationship then with. Orestes would be rather complicated. And as the story goes, when we follow the mythology and we look at um, the Greek plays that were in essence retelling the Greek myths, much the same as I'm, you know, I retell Greek myths. That's pretty much what I'm passionate about, right? So Orestes is the one who eventually kills his mother. So in order to get to that place, the relationship between him Orestes and his mother Clytemnestra has to be a bit rocky, a little bit tense. So um, I, what else is happening? So she's having the affair with Agathus. She's having other children. She's amassing some sort of support, political power. She's maintaining Mycenae. Her relationship with Agamemnon's remaining children is likely tense. So she also then, she's not really stuck on Mycenae. It makes sense that she would also have a complicated, intense relationship with Leda, who was um, her, who was, well, in the Bronze Age, I don't think Leda had any choice but to sort of, sort of, she didn't have any choice but to agree with Tyndareus allowing the, the marriage of Clytemnestra to Agamemnon in the first place. And I can't imagine, I, I can't imagine that Clytemnestra is really happy about that. There's also having to deal with um, her sister Helen's daughter who was left behind, Hermione. There's all these relationships that Clytemnestra has. That, I see my dog in the background. <laughs> that everybody, those, oh, there he is. That's Knight. He is my shepherd and he's everywhere. My lab happens to be down here at my feet, but okay, back on track. If I scoot over a little bit, I'm a block about, but that's okay. Is has to deal with her family, her family knowing what has happened to her. I don't think it's a secret from anybody what she has had to endure. So that creates a very complicated character as far as I'm concerned. And to when I think about as a daughter to have to live with the fact that your parent, your father, your mother are allowing something so heinous to happen to you in your life that that doesn't just sort of scar you, right? 
being forced to marry the man who murdered your husband or and your child also very hard to swallow hard. how do you how do you move one foot in front of the other like how do you sort of regather the pieces of yourself after that and and come out standing on the other side of that situation let alone be successful or victorious in your life journey having to deal with the children of the man who murdered your other child and not and not feeling conflicted about that and not having your children be conflicted about maybe your talk of vengeance i think it would all be very complicated for clytemnestra and yet she is strong she's strong because she remains she's strong because she doesn't run away she's strong because she's convicted and resolved to do this at least in, by the end right she's convicted and resolved to do this violent thing all to ease her pain and to avenge the murder of both of her children and her first husband it's something that even in the modern world i think that we can relate to i just want to read I just wanted to read a couple of scenes where I, the things that I'm talking about, what I've, what I've talked to you about is really so far is mythologically canon. And when I say canon, we can find through the various sources that these are the threads that we piece together of, of events that happened to Clytemnestra. And Clytemnestra entered the great hall to find her visitor intently examining a mural. Do you find it pleasing? The stranger turned to face her, a brief look of shock passing over his face. He bowed. Queen Clytemnestra. Clytemnestra nodded slightly, acknowledging his deference. Agathus? Forgive me. I've heard rumors of your dark beauty, but I didn't take them for truth. All queens are said to be most fair by their people. You mean in comparison to my younger sister, Helen, the whore who has taken half of every kingdom in the West? I beg pardon, my lady, I meant no offense. It's just, you're not what I expected. What did you expect? Agathus opened his hands in askance, begging your pardon, my lady. I have also heard rumors of the sad queen of Mycenae. I expected to find a pale wraith of a woman wasting away with her grief. Clytemnestra was taken aback by his honesty. I was unaware my sorrow traveled beyond my own house. That's the way of royal life, is it not? We believe our lives, our own, our thoughts, our own, only to find that everything we are has been debated in every household. <laughs> Do you think my sorrow makes me weak? The exact opposite, my queen. Of this, you are certain? Agathus nodded. You don't even know who I am. I know who, ugh, I hate that when I mess up when I'm reading my own stuff. I know who the sons of Atreus are, and I know what Agamemnon has done, and that is enough. Clytemnestra raised an eyebrow, the corner of her mouth lifting slightly. You have your own reasons for revenge, I'm told. I am the sworn enemy of House Atreus. The queen stood, extending her hand to her guest. Come. Let us refresh ourselves with sweet wine and cheese and away from this cold hall. So that's the introduction that I give for Clytemnestra and Agathus. In movies, we would call that the meat cute, but it's not so cute because it's already. There is a story in the mythology that talks about 
Palamedes and his father Napolis. So Napolis, I have to back up a, a second, I guess. So Palamedes is the servant of Agamemnon who tricks Odysseus into putting his baby son Telemachus in front of a plow to prove that Odysseus wasn't crazy, which then forces Odysseus to have to honor his oath to Tenzarius and go fight uh, for Helen under Agamemnon and Menelaus. So that's who Palamedes is. And Palamedes is subsequently killed by Odysseus, no surprise. Napolis then decides that his son has been murdered and he doesn't get any justice through Agamemnon and he decides to sail back to the Greek kingdoms and wreck, just wreck as much homecoming as he can. His mouth settled to a hard line of indifference. That would have been welcomed news. So why have you come here? Has he, meaning Agamemnon, sent you with word or two for me, our children? Again, Napolis choked. The sharp coldness in her voice sliced his confidence in half. He began thinking he should not have come to Mycenae. No, I've come bearing no news directly from your husband. Clytemnestra shuddered at the word and her patience thinned. What is your news then? I wish to that he silently cursed the queen's unwavering stare. He finally spit out. Agamemnon has encouraged his army to take foreign women in place of their proper wives. Napolis watched her face soften. And then she laughed. Who are you? Speak up. I am Napolis. Her laughter showed, excuse me. Her laughter slowed as she considered him. Why did you go to Troy when clearly you are too old and frail to fight for war? To avenge my son's murder. What happened to your son? I believe he was betrayed by someone, set up for conspiracy. However, I know he would never have betrayed his king. His king? Which king did he serve? Odysseus, Menelaus, Diomedes? My lady, he served Agamemnon. Clytemnestra straightened. With a voice as sharp as a blade, she asked, Who was your son? Palamedes, my lady. The mask of civility dropped, shattering into a thousand pieces on the floor, for one for every ship that sailed from Aulis. You! You dare to come here, seek an audience with me! Napolis backed up only to inform you that the king encourages dishonor among his men and does not deserve such a faithful wife. The queen's voice shook with growing rage. He has long been dishonorable in my eyes and I pray silently to the gods to take his life in some grotesque way. She began to laugh hysterically. <laughs> Clearly you have no idea what your son has done to me. It was his wretched hand that drew the blade across my daughter's neck at Aulis. That bastard deserved to die. If he were not dead, I'd kill him myself. Napolis realized too late his mistake. He hadn't known about Aulis. He'd assumed the deed was done at the hand of the king. Palamedes hadn't shared that bit of truth. I, I, I didn't know. Apologize. He began to back away faster toward the audience chamber door. With a black hatred blinding her to all else, she lunged at her guest. I will kill you with my own hands. And she pushed a table aside, sending pottery crashing to the ground. Napolis scrambled, tripping over the hem of his cloak. The queen managed to grab the front of his tunic in her hand, bringing him close to her as she reached her free hand for the blade hidden in the folds of her gown. I will kill you myself. The raised voices and the clamor brought the queen's guards rushing into the room and they pulled their queen to safety. Napolis, visibly shaken and in fear for his life, was trapped between two guards awaiting Clytemnestra's command. At that moment, she realized that if she ordered Napolis' death, word might get back to Agamemnon of what she'd done. And if that happened, 
he'd realize the extent of her rage, jeopardizing her plans to avenge her daughter's murder. Sensibility slowly returned to her. Let him go, she said, the steady coldness returning to her voice. No one was more surprised than Napolis by her command. As soon as the guards released him, he ran as fast as he could, hobbling and tripping from the palace with Clytemnestra's cold laughter ringing in his ears. That might be my favorite scene because it, Clytemnestra was already on the path of self-destruction. Uh, she was willing to sacrifice anything that she needed to in order to avenge Iphigenia's death. And then in her heart, the things that she had buried, the son of the, the, the death of her infant son and her first husband. So I hope that that gives you a little bit of insight into what's driving Clytemnestra to that end, that, that when she comes back, or excuse me, when Agamemnon comes, comes back from Troy with concubines, right? So that's a whole other story. How she would react and why she was so determined to basically have no mercy and no sympathy for anybody that, that Agamemnon brought back, for Agamemnon himself, and why we can really view her as a character we have sympathy for, regardless of the things that she has done. Anyway, that's it for today, and I hope you enjoy this, and I will catch you next time.